There we are. So to introduce myself properly to you, I'm Peter Webb. I'm the International Tax Manager at the Fry Group. I've been with the Fry Group since the beginning of 2014. I started life in Exeter with the Fry Group. I'm now based permanently in Singapore as at last year. Before the Fry Group, I was with one of the big four accountancy firms for, for, for many, many years. I know that some of you are familiar with the Fry Group, but for those who aren't, just a very brief overview before we start. So we were established 120 years ago. And since then, we've helped thousands of people around the world and across the generations. Today, we have eight offices around the world, so can offer a truly global perspective. So our service covers three core areas of financial planning. So we're looking at tax, estates and investments. And today we're really going to be concentrating on that tax piece. So our teams work together across those areas and across countries to create the right balance for each of our clients. So our core purpose is to create a financial freedom for our clients. And we understand that financial freedom can mean different things to different people. So we take time to find out what's important to you. And then we can structure your finances around your goals. Okay, I hope that gives you a bit of a sense of who we are. And now we're actually gonna move on to the main event. Okay, so planning a tax efficient return to the UK. Uh, the global pandemic has created significant changes to all of our lives. Uh, with many expatriates facing an unexpected return to the UK due to career or personal reasons. I think over the last month, I've spoken to perhaps in excess of 70 expats who are now planning their return to the UK. And for the majority, this is an unforeseen move or they've accelerated their return due to the current circumstances. So let's get started. So today's agenda. So please do bear in mind that you should not take any action on the basis of my presentation today without seeking specific tax advice for your circumstances. And please do bear in mind that I'm only talking about UK tax. Please do have regard to any other tax implications there may be for you anywhere else. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna be doing a lot of talking but uh, you don't get away scot-free. You have to participate as well. And through the, the presentation, I'm gonna be asking a few questions. The first of those is gonna come up on your screen now. So the first question that I'm actually asking you is which tax are you most concerned about? Is that income tax, capital gains tax, or inheritance tax? And that should actually be popping up on your screen now. We can, there we go. All right. Well, there's, a, there's a, quite a few responses already. I'll just give you a little bit of time to put those responses together. So we've got about oh, three quarters of you, of you have voted. So we'll give you just a couple of more seconds. Okay, all right, I think that's stabilized really. So perhaps we'll close the polling there and we'll share the results with you. So income tax, 58%, capital gains tax, 43%, and in a dim and distant third place, inheritance tax, 22%. That's a real surprise actually, as we go through the presentation. Uh, you, if, you, if I were to ask you this question again at the end of the presentation, I really do wonder if I don't actually get the same result. Okay, thank you very much for your participation with that. Okay, there we go. All right. So what do you need to consider before returning to the UK. There are an awful lot of ducks that you need to get into a very neat little row before you come back to the UK. The plan does need to be a good one. So timing, when do you need to come back to the UK? What date do you need to be in the UK? That can have a really significant tax implication for you. Accommodation, 
you'll see as we go through the presentation that can be crucial in determining your UK tax resident status is very important to get the timing of accommodation right. And who? Who's going to move back first? Will your family move ahead of you and you trail perhaps later on? Again, that can cause uh, tax complications that you need to understand. Cost of living. Your cost of living overseas, perhaps in, in a low tax jurisdiction, uh, perhaps that tax cost isn't quite so significant for you. But perhaps when you're in the UK, it's going to be one of the key concerns. How much of your income will be taken in tax? Are you going to be back for good? Again, significant tax implications for that one. And tax, when do you become subject to tax in the UK? That's a really important point to understand. One of the key considerations for that plan to return to the UK. So why do you care about becoming a UK tax resident? Very simply, your UK tax resident status determines your liability to UK taxes, particularly income tax and capital gains tax. As a non-UK resident, if you've been out of the UK for five years, then your liability to income tax and capital gains tax in the UK is really limited. We're only going to tax you perhaps on UK sources of income and in terms of capital gains tax what we're looking at is just the disposal of UK land and property uh, or and to be complete the disposal of assets used in a UK trade but any other income any other capital gains tax gains that you make are not taxed in the UK so when you are UK resident if the UK is your home country, if you're what we call a UK domiciled person, you're charged a tax on your worldwide income and gains as they arise from the date you become UK resident. So the difference in your tax exposure as a non-UK resident as opposed to a UK resident it, it is actually really significant for you. So, We've mentioned that tax resident status, why that's important. The other tax status that you have is what we call your domicile status. It's not the same as residence. Tax residence is assessed each year under the statutory residence test. We'll talk about that. Your domicile status is quite different. And it's, I would say it's assessed over your lifetime. Everybody has a domicile status at every point in their lives. And if you're a UK domiciled person, that UK domicile status means that you are liable to UK inheritance tax on your worldwide estate. And it's that UK domicile status that also means that when you're resident in the UK, you are taxable in the UK on your worldwide income and gains as they arise. But what about if you're not UK domiciled? If you're not UK domiciled, it is only UK assets that are within the possible charge to inheritance tax in the UK. Your overseas assets are not within the charge to inheritance tax. We'll talk about that more later on. But when you're resident in the UK, but you're not UK domiciled, there could be a big advantage for you. And again, we're going to come on to that. Okay, so we've talked about the difference in taxation for a UK non-resident as opposed to the difference in taxation for a UK resident. So it's worth actually spending just a little bit of a, a little bit of our time just thinking about that tricky transition between becoming UK resident having been a non-UK resident. We're going to be saying the word resident an awful lot. Okay, so how do you know if you are a UK resident? So from 2013, your UK tax resident status is determined by quite a tricky piece of legislation. It's called the statutory residence test. 
And each year, you need to work through this statutory residence test to determine your UK resident status. So it's a three stage test and you work through the three stages in order. The first stage asks, are you automatically non-resident? Can you meet the tests for automatic non-residents? And if you can, you are done. You are non-resident for the tax year. You don't need to look at it further. But if you can't meet those automatic non-UK residence tests, you then have to move on to stage two. And stage two determines whether you meet tests for automatic UK residents. And if you meet those automatic UK residence tests, then you are UK resident for the tax year. So stages one and two are around automatic tax resident status. Stage one for automatic non-residents, stage two for automatic residents. But if you don't meet any of the automatic residence tests, then your UK resident status is determined by what we call the sufficient ties test. And this is the third stage of the statutory residence test. So that sufficient ties test looks at the connections you have with the UK. The more connections you have, the less time you can spend in the UK and be non-UK resident. The less ties you have, the more time that you can spend in the UK and maintain that really helpful non-UK resident status for you. So that second bullet point on this slide is really quite scary, isn't it? You can be UK resident with as few as 16 nights in the UK, but on the other hand, you can be non-UK resident with as many as 182 nights in the UK. Your personal circumstances are likely somewhere between those two numbers, and we can certainly talk to you about that. Okay, split year treatment. Now what we saw on our previous slide was that under this complicated statutory residence test, you're either UK resident or you're not UK resident. So if you're UK resident, by default, you're UK resident for the whole tax year. So if you're returning to the UK, you test positive for UK residents, then you're UK resident for the whole tax year, which runs from 6th of April to the following 5th of April. And we've said that if you're a UK domiciled person as well, what that would mean is that from 6th of April, you are then fully taxed in the UK on your worldwide income and gains. So that, that could be quite significant. However, Provided that you can meet the conditions, you can benefit from a thing called split year treatment. And split year treatment is going to be very helpful for you because what it does, it allows you to become UK resident at a date further into the tax year rather than becoming UK resident on that default date of 6th of April 2020 in this tax year. So, Split year treatment allows you to remain UK non-resident until a date within the tax year. And from that date where you trigger UK residence, you're then fully within the tax net from that date rather than from the start of the year. So split year treatment is complex. I think one of the things we really like about this, the statutory residence test is that if you can abide by the conditions, it gives you complete certainty over your tax residence status. What we don't like about it is that it is very complex and it does have pitfalls and bear traps for the, for the ill-advised or the unaware. So uh, expert advice is definitely needed, especially for split year treatment in the year of your return to the UK. There are up to five different ways you can trigger UK residents using split year treatment. And interestingly, the date you actually land in the UK is not one of those dates. 
There are five different cases that could apply. Usually more than one of those five different cases is going to apply to you. And if more than one of those five cases apply, they then have an order of priority, which you need to understand. There could be a date that makes you UK tax resident earlier than another case, for example. So as I say, expert advice is definitely needed for this tricky split year treatment in the year of your return. So split year traps to avoid. As I say, this split year treatment is very complicated. The rules are, are hard to understand sometimes. So when we think about somebody coming back to the UK and possibly qualifying for this really helpful split year treatment, we need to be aware of a couple of traps. And I think rather than talk them through, it's probably easiest to give you a couple of genuine real life circumstances that I've come across in the last few years. So I'll, I'll illustrate these for you. The only thing I've changed is actually the names and that's to protect the innocent. So our first story is Duncan. Duncan was living and working in Singapore for many years. Now, he returned to live in the UK in 2018. It was actually November 2018. And between the, be between the beginning of the tax year, 6th of April 18 to November 2018, he did not visit the UK at all. Not a single day in the UK. And in those months, he was earning very well indeed in Singapore. Now, his wife and children went back to the UK in June 2018. And this was to make sure that they got accommodation sorted out and to make sure that the children were well placed to join the school year at the beginning of September. So what happened to Duncan? Duncan became UK resident and fully liable to UK tax on his worldwide income and gains from June when his wife and children started to have a home in the Okay. So for him, his Singapore earnings from June to November were fully taxable in the UK. That certainly wasn't the result he wanted. It wasn't the result he expected. It wasn't the result he actually planned for. So another story. Uh, this is for Giles. Now, Giles returned to the UK in D December 2017, and he had been living and working in Dubai for, for many years. But his wife and children had continued to live in the UK throughout his time working overseas. Now, he is coming back to the UK in December 2017, but his rental agreement in Dubai ended in August 2017. He had the option to renew for another 12 months, but because he's going back in December, he decided not to do that. So rather than renew the rental agreement on his apartment, he actually uh, moved into a service department and it was on the Fairmont Hotel on the Sheikh Zayed Road, if you know Dubai. And he became UK resident and fully liable to UK tax on his Dubai salary at the end of August 2017, when he started to have his home in the UK. Or well, beg your pardon, when he started to have his only home in the UK. So that was very significant because all of his Dubai earnings, which are not taxed in Dubai from August to December, needed to be fully taxed in the UK. Again, definitely not the outcome he wanted or was expecting. With both of those examples, what I would say to you is that neither Duncan nor Giles came to us for advice first when they were planning to then move to the UK. We, they only approached us after the event and there was little action that could be taken at that point. So I think the moral of those stories is the rules are very complicated. Please do seek proper advice well in advance of your move back to the UK. Okay, so we've talked about your liability to UK tax as a non-resident. And we've said that if you're non-UK resident for more than five years, you get freedom from UK capital gains tax 
apart from the sale of UK property and assets used in a UK trade. But if you've been UK resident for less than five years, the situation is somewhat different. So there are some anti-avoidance rules. We call these the, the temporary non-residence rules. So if before you left the UK, you've been resident for four out of seven years, and you're going to be outside of the UK for less than five calendar years, these rules apply to you. They are complicated. You will need to take advice about this. But I think the most common thing that's caught under these temporary non-residence rules are capital gains. So if you owned an asset before you left the UK, you sell it during that period of temporary non-UK residence, then that capital gain becomes charged to UK tax in the year that you return to the UK. So if you think that's you, if you think you, you might be caught by those rules, it's really important to understand firstly the date you became UK non-resident when that five year clock started ticking and the date you're gonna trigger UK residence again. There could be some really simple actions you take just to extend your time overseas to make sure you don't fall foul of these rules. Again, all good advice that we can help you with. Okay, so before we get stuck into this slide, I've got another question for you, just to make sure that you're still awake and you're still bearing with me. So my next question, what is the highest rate of capital gains tax you pay on selling property? So that polling question should be coming up on your screen now. So have a crack at that one, see how well you do. Lots of answers coming in quite quickly now. Okay, I think about 80% of you have voted now, so I think we might actually close that there and just see how we did. Okay, so absolutely, I think you nailed it. You nailed this one, 28%. That's the top rate of capital gains tax on property for, for UK tax purposes. A few of you went for 20%. No, that doesn't apply to property. Uh, that applies, that's the top rate of capital gains tax on, on other assets, for example, shares. Uh, I think um, one of you went for 10%. Um, I, maybe that was a little bit of wishful thinking. There are some really peculiar circumstances where you could get a 10% rate on UK property, but it's very unusual. And uh, yeah, we, talk to me and uh, I'll tell you what that is. Okay, so we're gonna take that away. So at the beginning of the presentation, I was really stressing that resident status and also that domicile status. And I, I kind of gave you a bit of a spoiler alert on some things that we need to talk about now. So you've come back to the UK, you are UK resident, but perhaps you're not UK domiciled. So if you're UK resident, but not UK domiciled, you do have the option, and it is a choice, to exclude your overseas income and gains from being taxed in the UK. Now just to back up a second, if you're UK domiciled, remember, and you're resident in the UK, you're taxed on your worldwide income and gains as they arise. This only applies to somebody who's not UK domiciled. Uh, in a few slides, I'll explain a little bit more about that non-UK domiciled status. But if you're UK resident and non-UK domiciled, you can use this very special basis of taxation, and it's called the remittance basis. There are some really complex rules around claiming the remittance basis, which allows you to exclude overseas income and gains from UK tax. There are penalties for doing that. The benefit is that your overseas income and gains are not being charged at UK tax rates, but it's only really gonna work for you if you're genuinely able to have income and gains arising outside of the UK, which you don't need to bring into the UK. In addition, you lose your entitlement to personal allowances for tax purposes. So each year a UK resident is entitled to earn 
£12,500 of income without paying tax, you lose that entitlement. And in addition, once you've been resident in the UK for seven out of nine years, then there's a really high annual charge that comes in if you want to choose to use this remittance basis of taxation. It's £30,000 a year to start with, and then when you've done 12 out of 14 years, it goes up to £60,000 a year. So what I would say in respect of time limits for the remittance basis, we're looking at seven years for 30,000, 12 years for 60,000. But actually, once you've been UK resident for 15 out of 20 years, that non-UK domicile status, which could be really beneficial for you, falls away and you're deemed to be UK domiciled at that point. So the benefit of that non-UK domicile status, which could be really helpful for you, is time limited for income tax, capital gains tax, and inheritance tax as well. Okay, just get my little clicker to work. There we go. Okay, all right. So getting ready for your return to the UK. So what I mean by that, what are some of those pre-return actions that we're going to suggest you take to make sure that you can become incorporated into the UK tax regime with as little harm as possible? So first one that we're going to consider is employment income. And the first bullet point here is around termination payments from your overseas employer. This is really tricky. If you feel you're going to get a termination payment in respect of your, your overseas employment, it's very important that you take specific UK tax advice. The, ways, the way the rules are written, and this is from 6th of April 2018, so new rules. If you receive a termination payment, and that termination payment is in respect of an overseas employment, and you are UK resident at any point in the tax year, you receive that termination payment, that termination payment could be subject to UK tax. Even though it's got nothing to do with UK employments or UK duties. There are a couple of ways out of this. So the first one, very simple, just make sure you remain UK non-resident the, for the entire tax year, your overseas employment ceases. That's belt and braces, that's what you need to do. The other thing that you might want to consider is are you living in a jurisdiction which has a favourable tax treaty with the UK? And if you can be sure of that, then if you can be certain that you are tax resident in that favourable country and also non-UK resident at the time your contract is fully terminated, you could then possibly rely on the double taxation agreement to exempt that termination payment from UK tax. It's really quite a nasty rule. It is fresh out of the box. Definitely take some advice if you are going to receive that termination payment in respect of your overseas employment. So share schemes, long-term incentive plans, we see these very often and they're likely to have UK tax consequences. So a share scheme, long-term incentive plan, the most likely scenario with this is that the plan pays out or the shares are released to you after you've become UK resident. And if that is the case, there are income tax considerations for that in the UK and also capital gains tax consequences in the UK as well for shares. So if that's you, if you're in one of those long-term incentive plans, if you do have a share scheme and your award period straddles your return to the UK, it's very important to take specific UK tax advice for that. But what you might be able to do is speak to your employer and just get them to accelerate the vestings while you remain UK non-resident. We can certainly speak to you about that. Another really common thing I see is somebody who has a bonus. 
and that bonus is going to be paid to them after they've actually returned to the UK. But to give an example of this, I was speaking to somebody just last week, they have a bonus for the calendar year 2019, but it's not actually going to be paid to them until June 2020. Now they became UK resident on 6th of April 2020, after many years overseas. But because that bonus, which is paid in June, relates to a year when they were fully UK non-resident and didn't do any of their duties in the UK, that bonus is not subject to UK tax, even though it's paid to them after they've become UK resident. Okay, so we've talked about employment income. Now it's time to talk about your investments and what you need to do with those to get yourself ready for that return to the UK. So the, the big uh, caveat to this, the health warning, is that I'm speaking to those of you who are not caught by those tricky temporary non-residence rules. So this is advice for people who have actually been outside of the UK for at least five continuous years. So if that is you, the advice is really simple in terms of what you do with your investments. Assets standing at a gain, you realise that gain, you sell the asset, you dispose of the asset while you remain UK non-resident and that avoids the, uh, the charge to capital gains tax in the UK. I think importantly you do need to understand if there are any tax implications on doing that where you are resident. Assets standing at a loss, you simply keep those and you realise that loss, you dispose of the asset after you've become UK resident. And the reason for that, if you're non-UK resident and you realise that loss, generally you can't set that loss against capital gains arising in the UK. But if you realise that loss after you've triggered UK residence, then that loss can be used set it to set off against future capital gains. Okay, final bullet point on this slide is a really important one. Should you cash in your overseas pension scheme? And I'm going to give you a, a real tax accountant's answer on this, it depends. So you need to consider what type of scheme it is. Not all overseas pension schemes are equal. You also need to consider the tax jurisdiction jurisdiction you're in and whether there's a favourable double taxation agreement that's going to help you that could save you some UK tax. You also need to consider what the tax implications are for your overseas pension scheme drawing income from that after you've become UK resident and your retirement needs. So having said all of that with your overseas pension scheme the one thing you shouldn't do is not take any advice. What you should do is seek advice just to see if there are some actions you can take now as you remain UK non-resident, which are gonna save you tax after you've come back to the UK. So after you come back to the UK, what we're gonna think about then is you need a tax efficient strategy for life in the UK. You need to maximise your use of tax allowances and relief. So your investment strategy at the moment is likely set up for a tax regime which is far less confiscatory than the UK tax regime. Now having said the UK tax regime is confiscatory, there are certainly allowances that you can access for tax efficiency and I've listed some of them there for you. So you, each year on a lose it or use it basis you have that tax-free personal allowance, a dividend allowance, a savings allowance, a capital gains tax allowance. The one I'm going to pick up on actually is the ISA allowance, that individual savings account. As a non-UK resident you can't invest in an ISA but when you become UK resident, you can. 20,000 pounds, so a couple can put 40,000 pounds into an ISA each year. That can hold securities, shares, unit trusts, cash. Once it's in that ISA, the, the funds are then sheltered from 
income tax and capital gains tax. £40,000 a year, that allows you over a few years to get a good chunk of your investments into a capital gains tax and income tax free environment. And thinking about that transition to the UK, thinking about you know, your tax efficient strategy, moving funds around, for example. So if you're going to transfer large amounts of currency to the UK, um, for example, for a house purchase, or indeed to for your UK tax efficient investment strategy, what I would say to you is that um, it's worth looking outside of your bank for the exchange rates you use for that transfer. So there are other providers who will transfer money for you and their exchange rates might be better than those you have at your bank. And a small change in exchange rates can actually save you an awful lot of money when you're transferring money from perhaps overseas to the UK. All right, special rules for UK land and property. So this is probably one of the most common questions I'm asked. Should I sell my property before I become UK resident? So as a non-UK resident, and you're not caught by those tricky temporary non-residence rules, when you sell a UK residential property, it's only the gain arising after 5th of April 2015 that is charged to tax. That could be hugely beneficial for you. Perhaps you purchased a property in 2003, you're selling it in 2020. Well, rather than tax the gain arising from 2003 to 2020, you're only taxing the gain arising from 2015 to 2020. So it's something to consider. Should you take advantage of your non-UK resident status, the dispose of UK residential property. Just a quick mention that if you do dispose of UK land and property, that has to be reported to HM Revenue within 30 days and any tax paid within 30 days as well. These are new rules. Uh, we can certainly help you make those reports and calculate how much tax you need to pay within that really short 30 day window. It's really important to consider whether you've lived in that property as your home before. Because if that is the case, that default of actually using the 5th of April 15 value as a non-resident may not give you the best result for capital gains tax purposes. There could be extra, relief, extra capital gains tax reliefs that apply, and you might be better off living in that property as your home again after you return to the UK to further increase the capital gains tax reliefs that might be available to you. And again, all good advice we can help you with. This is a very regular exercise for us when we help clients understand what is the best thing to do. Sell as a UK non-resident or perhaps uh, maximize what we call the main residence relief that you can enjoy for capital gains tax purposes. Okay. So now is the time to think about inheritance tax. And um, we're gonna have a little polling question coming up on your screens now. And this question is, what is the rate of inheritance tax? And those options are coming up for you now. So have a little bit of a think about that. We've got about 70% of you have voted and you've voted in a very, very interesting way indeed. Okay, so I think we've got 80% there. I think that that's where we'll call it. Okay, so 78% of you went for that 40% inheritance tax charge. 16% uh, of you went for 36%, 20%, uh, 20% that was 10% of you. I do apologize, I was being a bit naughty. This is a trick question. These are all rates of applicable inheritance tax. It could be 20%, 36% and 40%. So thank you for that. Thank you for your participation. So we've mentioned as we've gone through that your liability to inheritance tax is based on your domicile status. As a non-UK domicile, 
then your liability to UK inheritance tax is simply your UK assets. Anything you have outside of the UK is generally not charged to UK inheritance tax. But if you're UK domiciled, then your worldwide estate is fully within the scope of UK inheritance tax, no matter how much time you've actually spent outside of the UK. Now that's not to say you can't change your domicile status. That is possible, very hard to do, but it is possible. So that domicile status generally derives from your father's domicile status. You acquire a domicile of origin when you're born. Matters can become far more complicated than that. So please do seek special, uh, I think specific advice, specialist advice around your domicile status if you have any doubts at all on that. So if you're not UK domiciled, and you're actually coming to the UK, then action can be taken to permanently protect your overseas assets from UK inheritance tax. If you remember, I told you that the maximum amount of time that really helpful non-UK domicile status can last is 15 out of 20 years of UK residence. But that non-UK domicile status could actually evaporate a little bit more quickly than that. So the ability to permanently exclude overseas assets from UK inheritance tax, even past the point where you've deemed to become UK domiciled, is enormously helpful. That, that's some really, really good advice we can help you with. The third bullet point here is around making gifts to your beneficiaries before your return to the UK. So I think one of the simplest ways of getting value out of your estate, reducing that exposure to UK inheritance tax, is actually gifting assets in your lifetime to your intended beneficiaries. And if you survive seven years from that gift, and you make sure that there are no strings attached to that gift, you're not reserving a benefit in that gift, then after seven years, the value of that gift falls outside of your estate. But why am I telling you to do this while you remain UK non-resident? Well, if you make that gift as a non-UK resident, there is no charge to capital gains tax. But for example, if you were to return to the UK and gift a buy-to-let property to the next generation, there's a capital gains tax charge which could be as high as 28%. It's definitely worth considering making these gifts while you remain UK non-resident and can avoid a charge to capital gains tax. My little clicky thing is failing me, so I'll just use the backup here. There we go, all right. So some of these actions that you need to take, okay. You need to tell HM Revenue that you've returned to the UK. So in the first instance, when you return to the UK, all that's required just make sure HM Revenue have an up-to-date correspondence address for you. That's so that you don't miss any vital piece of communication they're gonna pass on to you. So in terms of actually saying that you've become UK resident, that's all taken care of on your tax return. So this tricky split year treatment, you declare that on your tax return, you tell HM Revenue what the position is. If you would like our help with that, we'd be delighted to assist you that tax return in the year that you come back to the UK can be really tricky. So filing dates, due dates for any tax to pay, well for this year, 2020-21, that's the 31st of January, 2022. Okay, we, we are getting there, we are actually wrapping up. Uh, well done for staying with me this far, and if you're struggling at the moment, we're almost done, okay. Right, my key takeaways for today. Okay, so understanding the date you're going to become UK resident is absolutely essential to the plan for you to come back to the UK as tax efficiently as possible, because there are likely actions that you need to take before that date. Make sure you've understood what those actions actually are. And now is the time to think about reducing your exposure to UK inheritance tax. And the final thing I'm gonna to say to you is I've talked through the UK tax position. Don't forget your tax liabilities and your reporting requirements 
in the country that you're leaving or indeed in any other relevant jurisdiction. Okay, all right. Thank you. So we're moving on to have a look at some of the questions that you've actually been asking. Okay, so we'll have a look at these. First one, with the increased stamp duty on house duties, stamp duty being introduced for non-residents on in, in April next year, how long does one have to be living in the UK to be considered resident? Uh, presumably one could live with one of our children or rent a property. Well, you would trigger UK residents using this split year treatment or you'd be UK resident for the whole tax year. What I would say to you is that we can certainly talk you through this and make help you understand the date you become UK resident, but it's not just stamp duty that's affected by your UK resident status. Capital gains tax, income tax, possibly you start the clock running on uh, losing a non-UK domicile status. There are other considerations, but we'll be delighted to talk those through. Okay. Okay, there's a very specific question, uh, which we'll perhaps come back to you on privately. Uh, let's just, could I briefly run through the five cases of split year treatment? It's not going to be brief. Now, I will just very quickly give you the headlines on these. So the first is starting to have a home in the UK. That can be a trigger date for you. Ceasing full-time work overseas. If you've been UK resident in one of the four previous years prior to the year you're looking at, can be a trigger date for you. Another case is if you're the spouse of somebody under the previous case. That can be a trigger date for you when your spouse becomes UK resident. Starting full-time work in the UK can be a trigger date and starting to have your only home in the UK as opposed to having a home in the UK can be a trigger date as well. And if you think about those five different cases, could well be the case that more than one of those is going to apply to you. So care is definitely needed. Uh, so capital gains tax, if you acquire assets while non-resident and sell that asset as a non-resident prior to return to the UK, but you've been non-resident for less than five years, are you liable for capital gains tax? That's a great question. That's really heads up. So no, you're not liable for capital gains tax. Those temporary non-residence rules they apply to assets you owned before you became UK non-resident. So if you owned an asset before you became UK non-resident and then you sell it while you're non-UK resident and you're outside of the UK for less than five years, those are the assets that then come within the charge to capital gains tax in the year of your return. If you would like to speak about specific assets, there's some, some really specific advice we could give you for that. I've talked through the general situation for you, but that's actually a great question. Okay, another question. Uh, would it be worth testing HM revenue on whether they would accept remittance basis? So that would be a precedent for inheritance tax. Okay, that's a really, really good point can you get HM revenue to make a determination on your non-UK domicile status? I think that's what's at the heart of this question. And the answer is very simply, no, you can't. In the UK, we have an entirely self-assessment system. It's up to you to declare your hand to HM revenue and tell them what it is. You tell them what that domicile status is on your tax return when you are UK resident. But just because you've said you're UK non-domiciled, HM Revenue aren't bound by your assessment of the situation. Now, having said that, if you are submitting tax returns and you're declaring that non-UK domicile status, perhaps that is a little bit of ammunition you could use later on, but it certainly doesn't force HM Revenue's hand, that's for certain. Okay, there's a specific question. Well, I do beg your pardon. Let's go back to that. Uh, oh, that 
just goes to show that you shouldn't use your mouse wheel as you're answering these questions. Okay, back with it. Okay, does the UK have a double taxation agreement with Hong Kong with reference to termination payments? We will need to look at that one specifically. So termination payments, generally the, the term termination payment can cover a multitude of sins and there could be various different payments that make up an overall termination package and those individual payments could have their own tax treatment. So something that's perhaps a non-contractual payment, so compensation for your loss of office, for example, is unlikely to be covered by the employment article in the double taxation agreement, which I think is article 15 on Hong Kong, but it's very likely to be covered if the Hong Kong double taxation agreement has an other income article. We would need to look at that specifically for you, and that's a piece of advice we can certainly give. Okay, so I'm not gonna use the mouse wheel and switch the slides around, so we'll just scroll down a little bit further. Okay, there's a, there's a comment on French taxes, which I, I'm not going to cover that one. Uh, we don't actually uh, advise on French tax. Uh, we do have some contact details for French tax advisors. Okay, this is a great question. Is there any way to avoid triggering split year treatment if your family returns to the UK prior to your own return? Thank you, okay. So that's going to be tricky. <laughs> we would definitely want to go into writing on this. So please do not take my verbal comment as something you're going to take action on. But what I would say to you is the issue with a family returning to the UK before you, it's likely that they're going to start to have a home in the UK. And if they start to have a home in the UK, it's very hard for you to avoid having a home in the UK at that point too. Uh, so yeah, that's really hard. If your family avoided having a home in the UK until after you'd arrived, they could do it. So that might involve a lot of two week Airbnb lets or something. That's the only way I think you would do that. Um, but no, it's very, very hard. It really is tricky. We need to give you some proper advice around that. Oh, another good question. Uh, how, how do I establish today the value of a property as at 5th of April 2015? Now, this is something we come across really regularly. So in the UK, estate agents are now very well uh, set up and used to this question. They have a lot of expats asking them, what was the value of my property as at 5th of April 2015? And for a cost, they will provide you with that. For belt and braces, for uh, evaluation, that is going to be pretty much bulletproof for HM revenue, then you would use somebody who is a member of the Registered Institute of Chartered Surveyors. The onus is on you as the taxpayer to provide that valuation, and it's up to HM revenue to challenge that if they wish to do so. So to get the, the most qualified valuation, as I say, the RICS qualification, um, that's what I'm looking for. That valuation is the way to go. Okay, so uh, yeah, actually, following on from that, it's another question around that, and it's asking how does HM Revenue determine the value? HM Revenue don't determine the value, it's you who determines the value. UK completely self assessment. You have to tell HM Revenue what the answer is, and it's then up to HM Revenue to turn around and, uh, and challenge that if they choose to do so. So it's up to you to seek that formal valuation. Okay, so we still have a, a, a little bit of time. I want to try and get to a couple of different questions, perhaps on different topics if I scan through these. Um, okay, I'm just going to answer this one, which is around that domicile status, uh, which is, as you understood through this presentation, your UK domicile status is extremely important to understand because it is a determining factor for your liability to UK tax. So somebody's asked what needs to be done to change 
your UK domicile if you were born in the UK but have not been resident in the UK for 40 years. Okay, so I'm just going to make some very general comments on this. So being out of the UK for 40 years is likely not enough to change your domicile status. It's not about the time you spend outside of the UK. It's about the connections you have with the UK. It's about your affection for the UK. So if you still have strong connections to the UK, if you still have an affection to the, for the UK, if you still visit the UK regularly, uh, these can form part of a, a picture that builds up to somebody who has not yet relinquished their UK domicile of origin. As well as relinquishing that UK domicile of origin, you also need to be sure that you've chosen another country which is going to be your permanent home for the rest of your life. It's a really high bar test and it's up to you as the taxpayer to prove to HM Revenue that you've actually a, a acquired a domicile of choice elsewhere and displaced that domicile of origin in the UK. It's very, very specific advice for you personally, very much dependent on your personal circumstances. And we would certainly want to be uh, giving you a, a formal piece of advice around this. Uh, just anecdotally, this year I will have talked around, I, I think, four, I think of four clients this year so far who we've taken through the process of acquiring that domicile of choice outside of the UK. It's not impossible, but it's a very, very high bar test. Okay, I think maybe we have time for one more quick question. Uh, let's just... Okay. Okay, just one question I'm just gonna finish with. Uh, so, how long does one have to be living back in the UK before being charged to capital gains tax on the sale of one's sole property if it's overseas? I think very briefly what I'll say to you is that a married couple between them can have one property that qualifies for what we call main residence relief. And if there's a qualifying property and you've lived in it for all the time as your main or only residence, there is no capital gains tax charge on sale no matter where that property is, and no matter your UK residence status. Now, if you've left that property, you no longer live in that property, then the last nine months of ownership of that property are also treated as being occupied as your main or only residence and also exempt from capital gains tax. There are some really strange circumstances where you can actually get 36 months as that deemed period of final occupation but that, that applies really to moving into a care home or a property for a very vulnerable person. But generally, it's nine months. You have a nine month grace period to actually sell your UK property. Okay, so questions, we're gonna say, these are our contact details. This slide will come up again in a second. So these are our contact details if you do want to be in touch with us. Uh, following the webinar, but we'll also follow up with an email as well if you did want to perhaps request a copy of the slides today. But the next thing to do is just say a really big thank you. I've appreciated your participation in the questions. I hope you've got a lot out of the webinar and uh, thank you for the great questions you asked. They're, they're really, really good. I really enjoyed those. Okay, so thank you very much and I'm just going to leave you with those contact details for us just for a few more minutes.